Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome back to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Today, our guest is Chief Strategist and Dojo Master at Liger, and he is also an author. We are so excited to welcome to the show, Eric Holtzclaw. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So before we dive right in, tell our listeners a little bit about your background, your background as an entrepreneur, and how you really were led down the path of wanting to create Liger and and create everything that you do now. So I am a recovering technologist. So early in my career, I ran development shops. I started my career at IBM, but was only there for a very brief moment and then ended up at my first startup running kind of development, those types of things. And I got uh, recruited by some companies out of Silicon Valley to build professional services organizations for them. So that was sort of the sales side of my world. Uh, 9-11 happened and I was traveling a lot and you didn't travel a lot after that for a little while. And I started a research firm and then that from 2002 to 2012. Sold that business in 2012 and swore that I would never start another business, which may or may not be a bone of contention between my wife and I. <laughs> and around 2018, uh, I started or founded Liger by taking in two businesses and putting them together. So we are Liger because we're named after the movie Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, so if you've ever seen it, it was his favorite animal. And if you're going to run a marketing firm, it, it should be fun, right? Like it should be something fun. And so what's, my, what's funny, Eric, is that's what it made me think of, but I'm, I'm too professional to have ever brought up that reference. So it brings yeah. me so much joy that that's <laughs> actually where that reference came from. Well, I, I'm currently sitting in the Liger layer and I'm in, uh, Deb's glamour studio is which we call our podcast room. We have Tater and Todd are two of our conference rooms. We have a disco ball, the whole thing. So we really lean into that as part of our kind of background. Uh, so, sure. so yeah, so I accidentally started this company in 2018. We focus on B2B marketing. So we're primarily kind of FinTech, financial services, insur insurance, healthcare, things like that. Um, but it's a great space because it's really requires establishing a good brand and knowing how to do marketing correctly, because it's more of a relational than a transactional type of, of approach. So yeah. So yeah, that's as that's short as I can get all of that. As, as concise as you can make all the background. No, I love yeah. that. So, so part of your bio is you talk about your goal is to help businesses find their identities, their core values, craft their visions and establish their brands. I know that we talked a little bit before we even started the podcast about how establishing your brand is not always as easy as you think it's going to be. What are your strategies and tools and how do you help businesses do that? So we, we take them through a process, which we is a discovery session, but we call it brand therapy. So we get them in a room for eight hours or so. It's really the longest period of time we need to spend with clients because it's where we're downloading everything about the business. And we're looking at their brand, looking at who they're going after as an ideal client. And we're making sure we're kind of pressure testing it, right? So like, does this actually fit with what you're trying to accomplish? If not, and it needs to be aspirational, what changes might we need to make in order for those two things to really kind of come together? Uh, and that is sometimes a tough conversation. You know, we have people who come in and are like, we want to be this thing. And it's like, yeah, but you're this thing. And so we're gonna have to do this to get you there. Uh, one of the fun activities we do in that is we'll put their brand up against their competition or we'll put their brand up against their like ideal partners. And it's like, do these things seem to match? Like, would you expect these to all be in the same place? And so by the end of that day, we've got, and it's not death by PowerPoint. We do like stuff with cards. I, I tell people I really probably should have been a kindergarten teacher because we, you know, make them write stories and we put up notes and all this other kind of stuff. And by the end of the day, we have a pretty good feeling for where we should go and what it should look like. We then go off and talk about the client for a day. We do a thing called Funlandia and we come back and tell them, hey, so here's two or three ways that you could approach this. If you do this, here are the words you would use. This is the imagery. This is how this would look. If you do this, it's gonna be this. And we are trying to get them to make choice. One of the biggest problems in marketing is people don't understand that it's about making choice. 
It's not about everything. It's about a few things. And that's hard to do because everybody's like, they always want, oh, everybody's my customer. And it's like, no, no, we want to attract what you ideally like to work with and repel <laughs> what isn't good for you. And there's no judgment. Like some people go after, you know, maybe a, a more transactional business or some people want more, you know, higher end. Like we just have to make sure that that brand and the way that you're, you're presenting yourself is going to attract what you want and that you're being consistent with your message. Now that makes tons of sense. And now that you've been in this business for a while, are there some common mistakes that you see businesses making over and over that you tend to see a lot? Yeah, I mean, I think both in business and life, the secret to all of it is consistency. It is 100% consistency. And so what is interesting is in a small business, they are not consistent with their brand and how their brand shows up. And they can't afford to not be consistent. So if you look at larger brands, one of my favorite examples, so Old Navy, Target, and Apple all use white. It's one of the colors that's in their sort of color wheel. And you can predict what advertisement you're about to see just based on the white that shows up on the screen because they're so consistent with how they use that color. And small businesses, they, they get bored, they, they don't have the patience, and so they change it out. And what happens in that is we are so, there's, it t our attention spans are so short that the second that you change just the smallest thing about it, then I think it's something new. And so I start over the pattern of applying that brand. So if you're a small company, it's far more important that your logo always show up the same way. The way you say a thing always shows up this way. Like you really want to make sure that consistency is hitting because you don't have as much money to spend to drive your awareness and to, to bring people in the door to co eventually convert them. That makes perfect sense. Stan, Stan, I know you're full of questions for Eric. What do you have? Bunches of questions. This this conversation is particularly intriguing to me. I must I must tell you. And in more recent years, I've thought more and more about this concept of branding. And I've noticed sometimes when I bring up the concept of branding with people, it's like, oh yeah, we have a logo, <laughs> right? So much it's more. like yes, yeah. My my brand is a logo. Talk about. Let's talk about this. What. What are the elements? I mean, if we really look at the whole brand, what what do you see, uh, or what, what are all of the elements, or many of the elements? And I, I know it's way more than logo. So let's talk about what the elements are. Yeah. So so the work that we're doing, I, it's like it's putting flesh on the skeleton of your business. It's, you know, the, what is this thing going to look like? And one of the activities we'll do is like, if your brand was a superhero, what would be the superhero, and what would be its superpowers, and you know, who would it be its arch enemies? Like we start to really make it a personality like how does it look and feel and that's not appropriate to every brand but it is one of the activities it's when you talk about a brand as a logo well i have a name my name is eric that is not all of me like i show up in a certain way i i you, you will rarely find me in a business setting that i don't wear a jacket right like that's part of my what i'm trying to bring to the world i have ericisms things i say nobody else says so what are some of those things with that brand because we are naturally attracted to those things that sort of feel like us. And one of my favorite examples is when I owned the research firm, my business partner and I were the exact same age or very close. We made about the same amount of money because we were business partners. Um, everything demographically was about us was the same. He was a diehard Dunkin' Donuts person and I love Starbucks and neither of us would go into either. And they both sell coffee, but he liked that Dunkin' Donuts experience. It was, you know, quick and smelled like pastries and whatever. I liked how I like how Starbucks is. I like the bitter coffee. I like how they treat me. They know my name. That's all brand. That's all it is is brand because the product is the same. And so Starbucks is actually like the perfect like the perfect model to talk about branding, right? Because it's it's not just uh, it's not just the coffee, right? It's the way the place smells. It's the level of the light. It's the phrases the barista uses whenever she or he you know, takes your order or hands you yeah. your order, uh, you know, and, and I, and I still, and I, I talk about this with my team, you know, I've been to many Starbucks being, a, being somewhat addicted to the product myself. <laughs> and then I was in Taipei, Taiwan one time and there was a Starbucks and I walked into the Starbucks and it was in every possible way, exactly like the Starbucks in, in my neighborhood, right? They had somehow captured all of those elements even though the baristas had you know kind of a chinese accent right yeah. but mm -hmm. but but the the level of lighting 
the the sense of I could bring my laptop and work here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the smell, the aroma. And so I'm thinking, you know, those things aren't accidental. Somebody actually spent a lot of time thinking about that and they've designed it in. And I'm sure that there's a three ring binder somewhere that says if you're opening a new one, here are all things you have to do to make sure that you produce all of those brand elements. I'm sure that's true, right? Absolutely. And if you yeah. think about yeah. like Malcolm Gladwell wrote the book Blink and, yep. you know, that a, a human being in nanoseconds can tell if something is real. Or it's those things that you're taking care of and thinking of with your brand. And as a small brand, again, you can't afford to not get it right. If I'm a big brand and I make a mistake, I just spend enough money to cover the mistake. But as a small brand, I'm not, if I'm not consistent, then I, I don't have the budget to come back. So I've, I've had people tell me that if you really get the brand right, it translates to better margins. Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. So can you, I mean, without revealing any client confidences, do you have any stories to share about, you know, clients you've worked with where you've worked with them to, to really fine tune the brand and, and it's had that effect? Yeah. So we do a lot of M and A. So I know you guys focus on legacy, right? So one of the things that yep. people will do is sell their business at the end of the day. And so they, they can be suited by lots of different companies and we'll work with an M&A group where they've gone out and bought a bunch of brands and we'll help them to consolidate those brands into one common look and feel. And when they do that, then they can actually pay less for companies they're purchasing because those companies are now getting that brand where before they potentially paid more for the initial brands because those people felt their brand was better than the brand they were going to. Mm -hmm. So it does provide this kind of balancing act when you get into those situations, specifically if you think about legacy, like if I'm going to sell you my company and I think my company looks better, has better customers, <laughs> purchases it better, I'm going to demand a higher value for it. But if I'm being suited by somebody, it may be a reason I sell and I might sell at a discount because I'm going to get the stuff that you're going to give me from a marketing and a brand perspective and, and just perceived and actual better reach on the other side. And we all know, I mean, we literally, like when I ran my research company, the number one thing people would tell me why they wouldn't buy something or do it is because of money. That is the biggest cop out on the face of the planet. If you want it bad enough, if it's going to make you look the way you want it to, if it's going to smell that car, new car smell, you'll find the money. He's not the problem. There's some other reason. It's just a really, it's a lazy excuse for why you uh, have made a decision not to purchase something or do something. Eric so dropping some hard truth on us today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so you, you talked a little, you talked very briefly earlier in the conversation about your process. Could you expand a little bit? You know, if you had a, if you had a client, somebody just engaged you and they said, you know, we, you know, our, our, our brand, maybe we feel like it's muddled. What, what's the process? What's the time frame for, for how that works to, you know, to, to get brand clarity and get it implemented? So when, when we bring a client on, we start off and we send them what looks like an M&A document. So we do a kickoff call and we're like, hey, we want to see all this stuff. So like send me customers, PowerPoint presentations, digital properties, anything you want us to look at. And we're also going to do a little research on competitors or people in their space. And we then spend about two weeks getting all that together. And then we do this brand therapy session, which is a discovery session. And we promise them that they're not going to know anything at the end of the day. <laughs> We're bringing them in. These are the things we've uncovered. We have this process we take them through. We look at macro, micro trends, ideal clients. We do the thing called ROAR analysis, the card sort, all this kind of stuff. And then we send them away and we get together and do a Fundlandia and it's another like two weeks. And when we get done with Fundlandia, we come back to them and say, okay, this is what we heard. And if it were our company and our brand, here are the approaches that you should take. And you know, if it were our money, like this is how we would do it. And you can make one to three choices typically. And based on that choice, then we can tell you how we would take this to market, how it would roll out because certain things are appropriate to certain brands that are not to others, right? So like by making that choice, you're now defining how you're gonna take this thing and do the tactics. So strategy first, tactic second. So it typically takes us 30 days to do that part of it. So we get the people to, and it's a lot of fun. It's the it's the part yeah. everybody loves, right? It's like buying a house and getting to decorate it. You know, you're right. like, ah, you know? And then we go into what I call the pit of despair. Because for the next 30 to 45 days, 
we have to build all of the things that we just talked about. We may have to rework your website and think through your materials and come up with the messaging. And, and, but then things start to work up and it takes five to six months to do, to start seeing specifically if you're only doing organic, so you're not paying for traffic to start seeing return. But once you start to see that return, it becomes a flywheel. So um, you can supplement that with paid and we do see companies who just do paid, but the problem with just doing paid is when you turn paid off, paid goes away. So we wanna do it right such that you continue to get that organic traffic regardless of, not, regardless of whether or not you're paying for traffic. So that's Makes a short, short thing, but I, we get to the first part and everybody's like, ah, I get to pick colors and look at my logo and whatever. And then I'm like, and now the next two months is while we build everything. And you're going to be sad. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, love, I love that. One of the things that you do is helping create the branding and kind of creating some content. And you said your focus is on content that converts. What is content that converts? How, what does that process look like? Yeah. So when we think about a marketing ecosystem and I get in trouble because I talk a lot digital, but, but that's because we know that people verify you digitally, even if they meet you in person, digital is still incredibly important. And so we want to make sure that digital footprint is correct. And so we think about it in rings, there's a website and your website should be your best brochure. And then we have a content oh, ring and the content ring right outside the website is the most important part because it's where you're putting your educational pieces. Like you're teaching someone something about, what your business does. It's why shows on HGTV do so well when they're teaching you how to renovate the house. You're never going to do what they do. You just, you, it's a way for you to like understand it and then potentially go hire someone to do that for you, right? And then the next ring is SEO or social media. And your choice of SEO or social media is do people search for me or do they not know about me? So if they don't know about you, you're doing more in social. If they're going to search for you, we do more in SEO. And so we're using that content ring to drive people in. A simpler way to think about this is most people build their website like a catalog. catalog. So, they so they describe all the things that they do. You should think about your, your website as a magazine instead. So tell me the stories, like tell me behind the scenes, behind you know, answer okay. a problem or a question for me. And that's going to be the thing that uh, ultimately works because the search engines are not incented to send people to your site they are incented to answer people's questions. So if your website answers a question that your company does, then you will get traffic from the search engine because someone will end up on your site with, you know, five ways to build a, build a business that leaves a legacy. That's, that's a great way to look at it, right? Versus we're such and such, and these are the things that we do. It makes sense. And I don't know about you, Stan, but I'm thinking through several of our company's websites and thinking, I don't know, we're putting out a lot of information. It's not a magazine. It's not a magazine. So I love that perspective on thinking through what the feel that your website needs to give. I think a lot of times, especially as business professionals, we do so many great things and we have so much information. And so it's that constant fight to not put out every single piece of wisdom and knowledge and things that we do and services that we have and people we can connect you with. And I, I struggle, at least I speak for myself on that one. I struggle not to put too much of that out there and word vomit overwhelm people. Yeah. So th you think about the keywords. So what are people searching for? So that's the first, you know, like what would they search for that they might end up or what would be interesting in social and an important word that you used, if you're using, we think about you. So you can take we content and turn it into you content. Mm. So, you know, we, we assist you with, uh, creating a will. I'm just making legal stuff up, right? Yeah. Uh, you need to cover your loved ones by s setting up a will, right? Like there, there's just a, you've just, you've changed You've said the same thing. You just changed the pronoun, <laughs> just changed the pronoun. So simple, but it makes a huge impact huge. on, on, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. So, so I, I'm curious. Could you give me a couple of examples, like, uh, like, like if if there were, you know, I, I don't know if, if you guys do, like Academy Awards for best branding, but if there were such a thing, who what would be a couple of examples that we might all recognize of terrific branding? I, and I, I'm asking that question because I'm still remembering that Macintosh ad. Yeah. It ran one time. Yeah. The 1984, 1984 ad. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and 
And when I think back about, about, you know, all the elements in that, it was perfect and it ran once and it's like, it, 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 it made history. So like who's doing great branding out there now? Well, great branding depends on, depends on kind of the space you're in, right? And if you think about in your category, one that does a great job um, is I don't know, Fisher Investments. Fisher Investments does a great job. They, mm -hmm. they got to know like how much money everybody has because everybody's getting some message about, do you happen to have so much in your portfolio? Or are you worried about retirement, right? Like, and it's such a compelling message for people and they do a lot of things kind of around that. So in your specific category, they're one, I ran into one the other day and I can't remember their name. They're also in sort of the wealth management and like legacy management category. And they're, they have these kind of messages around that thing. Most people are worried that they're not gonna have enough money when they get into retirement or they don't know how they're gonna hand money off in a way that's gonna be tax free. So tying in there, you know, you get into commercial, Apple always does a great job, but so, so do so many other brands. It's any brand that you can tell who they are without even seeing the logo. Like, you know, that message is coming from that company. Um, that starts to become the indication of a, a stellar brand. Uh, you know, less is more. It's about as few words as possible. It's about, you know, really making your, you know, Publix like makes us cry every holiday. Like literally you can't watch a Publix commercial without like crying because you're like, oh my gosh, they've had Thanksgiving dinner together or whatever, right? So pulling at the emotion strings, I tell people marketing should be visceral. I either hate it or I love it, but don't do boring marketing. Our, our mission statement at our company is saving the world from boring, broken marketing. And marketing is either boring or broken typically, or both and specifically in the B2B space. I, I love that description. And one of the questions I always ask our guests is through the work that you do, what do you hope your impact is? What do you hope your legacy is? Did you just give that to us? Was that it? Yeah, that's our, le so the company's legacy versus mine. So it's two totally different right. things, right? But the, um, boring, broken marketing is our mission statement and our big tagline, which we'll probably carry into next year is be known. So be known. We work with typically secondary and third brands, like the brands that you don't know, but you should within a category to assist them with, you know, that specifically like M&A, like we're with a company that's, that's a huge company, but just because they just did M&A. So they're really not known that way because they were all these other companies. So we love to do these like messier underdog, like kind of work to get them better known in the category that they're in. That's great. And what about your personal legacy? That's a, so did, that's a tougher question. It is a tougher question, but I did go into this company again, accidentally, a little bit more eyes wide open than I did the last one that I exited. Uh, with this one, we're building it as more of a legacy brand. So it's set up as a firm model. So you as you know, lawyer firm, you know, where you've got people who have specialties and categories, same thing like an accounting firm. Marketing is becoming that. So you have people who know content really well and people who know design and whatever. So we're a partner model. And then the intent is that we would have some partners who would carry the brand forward. Uh, within their specific practice areas. So it's it's not all about you. No, good grief. No, I wouldn't. I'd, I, you know, I'm, I'm so much of like, uh, I don't know, like I have, so we, we follow EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system. Yeah, which sure. I'm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm the visionary and I've got an integrator and thank mm -hmm. God for the company. I have that, right? Because I'm the cowboy who's out there like, Hey, let's go do this thing. <laughs> whatever. Somebody's got to keep the thing running. So I'm really good at the first couple of years typically. And then I'm like, okay, so what are we going to do now? How are we going to change it? And you need to make sure that you've got people in place who, who just enjoy operating the business and scaling it as is. That makes sense. So you've worked with thousands of entrepreneurs and obviously you're a serial entrepreneur yourself. What would you say are a few of the top lessons that you have learned from working with all of these entrepreneurs? So back in the day, I owned this other company and I had a marketing firm come in and they told me I needed to start standing on stages and whatever. And I, I didn't do that. I was the operations guy. I was running everything, but nobody knew I was there. And so I started my podcast. I've been podcasting since like 2010 like forever. And I did it in audio first. And I wanted to interview entrepreneurs and find out what's missing in the ecosystem. So like, what made you, you know, did you not have enough money? Were there not a resources, those types of things. 
Now, what I learned is that entrepreneurs fall into two categories. So entrepreneurs are either rectify, meaning that they're trying to prove somebody wrong from their past and be like, hey, you told me I'd never graduate high school and look at me, I'm a millionaire, right? Or they're magnifies, meaning that they had a really great childhood, things were awesome, and they went off and really made that a big thing for them. And Steve Jobs, who you would think would be a rectify, is actually a magnify because at the age of nine, he went to his parents and he said, mom, dad, I was adopted. Somebody didn't want me. And his parents said, oh, no, Steve, we chose you. And so he became the chosen one for the rest of his life, right? And so what I run into with entrepreneurs, and this is a very long answer to your question, is that they need to be aware of their origin story. Because a rectify, employee, a rectify entrepreneur is typically building a business not for them. And so they kind of get stuck in the business and they can't get past and they'll do like things that are self-defeating, right? And then uh, the entrepreneur who's the magnify, those are great. We love those people, right? They, they're easier, but the, the rectifies definitely need to know their origin story. And then there are people who can't be entrepreneurs because they had really good childhoods. And so they should have a nine to five job because they've got hobbies and they do fun things. Like that's also okay, right? Not everybody's gonna be an entrepreneur. So uh, thinking through your source of why you're doing it. Very interesting. Very interesting things to think through. Stan, we're going to continue this conversation later off the podcast. So I, so, <laughs> so um, you did touch, you did touch Eric on your podcast called the claw and touched a little bit about on what our listeners can expect from that. Tell us a little bit about your book, Laddering, Unlocking the Potential of Consumer Behavior. What can our listeners expect from your book? So don't tell anybody here at Liger, but my first love is research. I love research. I love to find out why people do what they do. Like I, we, the company I had, we did 250 to 300 projects a year and across all kinds of topics, chewing gum, tractors, office supplies, websites, whatever. And so I encapsulated that research into that book. And so that book is about really why people do what they do. And so there's case studies in there that can be applied to a B2B or a B2C brand. And it gets people outside the assumptions we make because companies will always make these dumb assumptions about why somebody's not doing something. And it's like, well, why don't you go talk to them? Like, why don't you go ask them some questions? And you have to ask, a, you have to ask them why five times, which is why it's called laddering. So laddering is getting beneath the why. So you ask them why typically they tell you because I can't afford it or money. <laughs> You're like, okay, but really why, right? And then if you keep bringing them down, you'll get to that visceral reason why they're making that decision or making that choice. And then that's what you need to put your messaging around. So, yeah. Very wise, very interesting read. We can't wait wait to um, dive into that one. Right. This has been Stan, most I can see interesting, have... most yeah, interesting conversation. Say... Yeah. For sure, for sure. Eric, is there anything that we didn't ask you about that you would like our listeners to know about? No, I've had a very long history of things I've done. It's been a lot of fun. I, I enjoy, I, I like work and business and all the things. It's a, and I guess the only thing is like, you know, everybody's a little worried about the artificial intelligence. I think it's amazing. I think this, this is an, an amazing technology disruption. I put it in line with the internet and with like social media and smartphones. So this is going to be that disruptive to the industries and we can't ignore it. We've got to figure out how we're going to incorporate it. It makes us curators of content instead of creators of content. So let the mm. artificial intelligence create it. You've got to curate it. So that mm -hmm. it's a right and appropriate, those kind of things. But this feels very like back in the day, I was working with companies that had decided not to adopt the internet until later. And I'm seeing companies not adopting AI until later, mm -hmm. and it's going to put them behind if they don't go ahead and figure out how to incorporate it into to what they're doing. Yeah, um, our one of our financial advisors and marketers that we work with, we were he actually told I'm stealing his joke, Stan. Uh, Seth told us this joke earlier, and it fits right in here. He said that uh, using AI is a lot like talking, a wife talking to her husband. The husband has a ton of great information and answers, but the wife has to be very, very specific about the parameters and what she asks. <laughs> and I thought that is dead on. That is exactly true. So yeah. yes, AI is certainly something we're seeing emerging, even in the law you know, world with people trying to use AI to build different documents. And there are things that are great and there are documents that have <laughs> turned out terribly. So, you know, something that can't 
can't be ignored, uh, certainly. And uh, something that I'll, it'll be interesting to see over the next few years, how that grows and really becomes a part of all of our practices, businesses, marketing, lots of things. Yeah. What I love about AI is I'm an insomniac. And so it will talk to me at two or three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, Hey, so when, when your wife says sense. no, leave me alone and let right. me sleep. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining us on the show. For all of our listeners, this has been Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. And our guest today was Eric Holsclaw. For more information on Eric and the work that he does, you can find him at ligerpartners.com. And you can also find him at Eric Holtzclaw on LinkedIn, almost said Instagram, on LinkedIn, and we will link those for you in the show notes. Eric, this has all been fantastic information. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for letting me, letting me join. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.